driver are the multiple revolutions occurring in medicine and the life sciences. Now this one gets me really worked up because I have been focusing on the sector for over 30 years. And let's talk about what these multiple revolutions are. The first, of course, is DNA-based medicine. Because once you have an individual's DNA and you understand the interplay of the genes, you can tailor medicine precisely to that person or group of people. It means you arrive at personalised medicine, which makes our existing drugs and treatments far more effective. Because as you know, although the medical profession would claim otherwise, most medicine today is one size fits all. Now, who here has had his or her DNA decoded? So as far as you're concerned, DNA stands for do not ask. <laughs> I had my DNA decoded for the first time 11 or 12 years ago. And I discovered some very interesting things. For example, if we were all at this moment on a cruise ship and there was an outbreak of the norovirus, I could volunteer to go and clean up in the hospital because I can't catch the norovirus. I also found out that I'm more susceptible than most to type 2 diabetes. Touch wood, I don't have it but I'm more susceptible than most. And I've got a whole list of other things which are a guide to my future health, but not a prediction. But I have to tell you that the benefits of applying DNA to medicine are going to completely change the way medicine is provided. Within the next few years, every newborn child will have his or her DNA done at the point of birth or before birth. Because that means that every time, if at any time, that child when growing up or as an adult needs medicine and treatment, it can be tailored precisely to that individual. So that's the first of the revolutions in medicine and healthcare. The second, of course, is stem cell technology. Now, you've all read about stem cells. Have you had any, anybody experience of yourself or a relative getting treated with stem cells? You probably know that stem cells are used to grow human organs, like a windpipe, an esophagus. They can grow parts of kidneys. They've grown heart tissue. They've grown bits of kidney. What's happening is we're on the way to growing replacement organs. Not just to treat serious illness, but for some people, those who can afford it, for rejuvenation. And in 20 years, there is no doubt that if you want it, you can rejuvenate yourself with stem cells. You can rejuvenate your skin tones, your liver, your lungs, your heart, your kidneys, your skin, your hair. So I could be 90 years old, and with stem cell medicine, look as if I'm 30. With the skin tone, the muscle tone, the bright eyes, lustrous hair. But my question is this, if I'm 90 and I look like I'm 30, will I still want to go out clubbing? <laughs> because there's no stem cells that rejuvenate the mind, the psychology of getting older. And I'm old enough to be getting a glimpse of what it's like to see the mind begin to change. Not to want to go and do things like clubbing that looked a good idea when I was 22. Doesn't seem like such a good idea to me today. But this rejuvenation is a real thing. And I have a friend, a colleague in the same profession as I am, the futurist Ray Kurzweil. And Ray lives in California. He's from New York originally, then Boston, but he lives in California. And each time I see him, he says, 
Ray, are you keeping fit? Are you keeping fit? And I say to him, Ray, I know you're keeping fit. He said, we've got to live another 15 years, Ray. We've got to. He's the same age as me, exactly. And I said, why? He said, what, don't you want to see the future, Ray? He said, if we can live another 15 years, we can live forever. And I say, why? And he said, because we can see the damn future. And I say to him, Ray, how long have you been a futurist? And he says, 40 years. And I said, you've already seen the future, as I have. Because I'm living in the future I described in my books 30 odd years ago. And I don't have this desire, perhaps it's a Californian thing, to live forever. But yet there are people who will. And there's the children born today who may live almost infinitely. I'm not going to say infinitely because any mathematician here will immediately tell me nothing is infinite. And that, of course, is right. But we don't know if there's an upper limit to ageing. We don't yet know that. And if we could live as an older person, but with the health and the body and the vigour of a young person, not as an old, decrepit person being nursed along by medicine, is what's happening now. How many of us would want to? Now, we don't know the answer because we've never been there before. But it's going to arrive in most of our lifetimes. I mean, people here today who are under 40, for example, might think to themselves, well, if I, like my mum and dad and my grandparents, I probably live to be a healthy 90, maybe 95. But if you're under 40 today, you must rethink that. You're going to live to 120. Now, how's your pension plan looking? <laughs> So that's the second trend within, you see, you're beginning to get the idea that I could talk forever just about healthcare. And of course, I could. The third, yes. In, rewind 10 minutes, in yes. the UN's global population forecast, are they yes. taking into account no, scientific No, they're analysis? not. They're not. That population forecast is strictly on new youngsters being born. On current churn rates. Yes, that? current death rates, yeah. yes. And it isn't going to happen. <laughs> And there's another question that you've prompted. What's the morality of living an extremely long life when the resources for 10 or 11 billion people in this planet? But it, this is part of the crazy world of the future that I live every day. But I'm going to push on because there is more, more to come. The third revolution in healthcare is one that excites me beyond belief. It's digital health. Now, I have various digital health gadgets, not because I'm ridiculously unhealthy, but because of my research for interest. And on my smartphone, I have an ECG unit. I am able here and now to do an ECG, which artificial intelligence in the cloud can analyse and tell me immediately if I have any of the common beginnings of heart problems. And for a heart patient who has a heart condition, think of the wonderful advantage of being able to touch the two contacts on the back of a mobile phone with two fingers and to do the ECG. When you have a touch of angina or when you're feeling unwell or out of breath, I went to see my cardiologist recently, not because I have a heart problem, but because I wanted to discuss this and a routine checkup. And he said, Ray, I wish every one of my patients had this. Because from your history of cardiology, I can see what it was like for you in the mornings, in the afternoons, if you were a heart patient when you had a bad feeling, etc., etc. He said, This is what we need. This is real time ambulatory data. And that is where medicine's going. Not just on the heart, but on glucose for diabetics, on blood oxygen levels for people with things like COPD, and all of the other vital signs 
that are important to our well-being, including our blood chemistry. Now, as I said, I could really let this subject rock and roll, but it's going to change the way the very elderly are looked after. And if I were an investor, this sector would be really exciting me. You know one of the major problems we have in this country and in the developed world is people living longer and needing more and more care in nursing homes and similar. But with digital sensors, with the internet of things, we can look after people in their own homes as thoroughly as we could if they were in a hospital bed. And if you add in companion robots, if you add in permanent connection to family and loved ones, as well as physicians, you'll begin to see that we will be able to keep the elderly, those who aren't rejuvenating, them, rejuvenating themselves with stem cells, in their own beds, in their own homes, in their own kitchens, for much, much longer. And this will take enormous pressure off the health systems and the social care systems. And actually, think of the benefit to pharmaceutical companies. Some of you may have investments in pharmaceuticals. Think of the benefit to pharmaceuticals when the data from Fitbits and the other health watches and the devices still to come, because we haven't really got there yet. We're getting there, but we haven't yet got the glucose monitor, the diabetes monitor on the wrist. It's coming. We haven't yet got blood pressure on the wrist. It's coming. It works now, but it's not reliable enough to get FDA approval. When we have the ambulatory data and you're taking a particular drug, even if it's an aspirin, whatever drug you're taking, we can see its effect on your physiology at all times of day, when you're sleeping, when you're exercising, when you're eating, when you've got a head cold, when it's raining outside. And we've got it by the millions, which means that we can do real life drug trials. Because drugs are developed by doing trials under controlled conditions, and then the drug is released into the world. Millions of people take it, but you don't have the data on how it's doing. With wearables, the data comes back. Now, I could go on and on about health, but we're going to move on to accelerating. This is the sixth key driver of the future. Accelerating.